Snell's law provided for us a relationship between v1, v2, lambda1, lambda2, theta1, theta2, and n2, n1. It is what, in the end, led us to curved lenses. We didn't use Snell's law directly when we analyzed curved lenses, but understand that Snell's law is what is responsible for the refraction that took place in curved lenses. We just predicted, because of experience, what happened to specific rays without the need for using Snell's law. But Snell's law is what resulted in that refraction. Today we're going to start talking about curved mirrors, concave and convex mirrors. But remember, of course, that it's not going to be refraction that dictates the behavior of mirrors. It's going to be reflection. So the equivalent of Snell's law for reflection is much simpler. It's called the law of reflection. We're going to go over that real quickly. And then we're going to go into this analysis of curved, curved mirrors that result from this law of reflection. The law of reflection says, in essence, the angle of incidence as measured from the normal line, that imaginary line that we draw 90 degrees to the boundary, the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. In other words, theta 1, as measured from the normal line, will be equal to theta 2. It's as simple as that. We don't have to worry about any kind of ratio. We don't have to worry about any kind of trig functions like sine theta 1, sine theta 2, or any kind of inverse relationship like n2 over n1. Theta 1 will always be equal to theta 2, with zero exceptions. And just like Snell's law, leading us to the behavior of lenses, this will ultimately lead us to the behavior of mirrors. But before we talk about curved mirrors, I want to do a a just a couple short examples, one really, really quick and easy, one a little bit harder, using the law of reflection, just to make sure that it's, we internalize what it really means, and then we'll go into this analysis of curved mirrors that we were talking about. Two examples here. The first one could possibly be the easiest problem that you will see in all of Physics 30. We've got an angle of incidence here of 48 degrees. We know that it bounces off here, over here somewhere. What's the angle of reflection going to be? 48 degrees. What about the second one? The second one's not quite as easy. We've got two mirrors here, two boundaries here that light's going to reflect off of 90 degrees to each other. We want to know what angle it reflects off of the second one at. Well, let's draw the first one first. What's this angle right here? 55 degrees. All right. What's this angle right here? Yeah, we're going to do a little bit of geometry there, right? We know that it's going to reflect off of the same angle that it struck it at, but we don't know what that angle is. We've got to first find this angle. Can you tell me what this angle of incidence at the second boundary is? 35 degrees. Good. You know it's 35 because the angles inside a triangle add up to give me 180. 55 plus 90 plus 35 gives me 180. That means the angle of, refraction, of reflection, I should say, is going to be 35 degrees as well. So a little bit harder than the first one. We needed to do not only this law of reflection, but also a little bit of geometry. It is not common to see a question like this on a test or on an exam. We just want to expose you to it just in case, because you never know. Every year, they seem to surprise us a little bit with, you know, with, with the type of question they ask, or this, or that, or whatever. Um, we want to be surprised as little as possible, just in case. All right, let's spend some time now looking at curved mirrors, how this all translates into the behavior of curved mirrors, like converging and, and diverging mirrors. I want you to look at this page before you really write anything down. And I want you to see if you notice anything that kind of jumps out at you as being, I don't know, a little bit confusing maybe? A little bit different? Yeah? Things are switched, yeah. A converging mirror is concave. A converging lens was convex. A diverging mirror is convex, and a diverging lens was concave. Now, somebody this morning said, uh, why do they do that? Why do they name them like that? Um, when we talked about the North Pole and the South Pole and the definition of the direction of the magnetic field, you remember that? And it was kind of confusing because 
The North Pole was Northern Canada. Sorry, the magnetic South Pole was Northern Canada. That was a bit confusing. Uh, that was, that's an arbitrary definition of the direction of magnetic field. This is not arbitrary. Okay, this is not they decided to do this. This is the law of nature dictates that this is what it has to be called. If you have a converging lens, rays of light will converge at a focal point. A converging mirror, rays of light will converge at a focal point. But notice for the converging rays in a lens, they have to go through a convex lens. For the converging rays in a mirror, they have to bounce off of a concave or caved-in mirror. So it's not an arbitrary thing. It must be these names okay, because of the laws of nature, the laws of refraction and the laws of reflection. So this is a concave or converging mirror. See the picture that I have there? Like, this is like a funhouse mirror, right? You guys ever seen one of these mirrors where it's thinner in the middle than it is at the edges? It's kind of like a bowl almost. Okay, you walk up to it. Depending upon where you stand, the image characteristics can be dramatically different. If you stand really, really close to it, then you can see, look, this guy's nose is bigger, than, is bigger than his entire head. The image is right side up. It's virtual, and it is larger. But if you walk back from this, okay, the image will change characteristics. It'll look um, dramatically different. In fact, there will be a place where there is no image, period, just like there was for lenses. Diverging mirrors, we tend to see these a little bit more often. Convex, thicker in the middle than they are at the edges. The image characteristics, just like for diverging lenses, are always going to be virtual. What else? Look at that. What is it going to be? Virtual, smaller, and upright. Where have you seen a diverging mirror before? 7-Eleven, you see them at convenience stores. You used to see them a lot more at convenience stores than we do now. In a hallway, somebody said? Sometimes in hallways when they're going around a corner. Um, especially when people are like, when it's a place where maybe people are pushing stuff. If you have noticed in a hospital, you see, these, you see them a lot because people are coming around corners with stretchers and sometimes, you know, with IVs that, you know, they're kind of dragging behind or whatever. You don't want to collide with stuff, right? You want to see around the corner. You can see around the corner because the image produced is, although it's smaller, you have more field of view, right? You're able to see more. Um, the pool in Okotoks, the corner of the hot tub, you guys notice that? Okay, so the lifeguard can see the entire hot tub. Everything's smaller, but at least you can see more. The store clerk, everything is smaller, but at least the store clerk can see more, can see the entire store. Sometimes you see them in parkades, because sometimes there's a lot of blind spots there. Where else do you see them? In the context of driving, not parkades, but yeah, the 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 uh, passenger side exterior mirror of a car is slightly convex, not dramatically, sometimes not even noticeably convex, but the image sure is noticeably the image that's formed of, from a convex mirror. What does it say in those mirrors? Objects in mirror are closer than they appear. They're actually closer than they appear because the image that's formed in that mirror is smaller, upright, and virtual. Why do they do that? Why don't they just put a nice, plain, flat mirror on the right side of the car? Yeah? Exactly. That's a perfect way to say it. It does not expand your field of view. You can see directly behind it, and your depth perception is perfect, right? Now, when they put a convex mirror there, it expands your field of view, which is, a, which is a pretty important thing when you're driving a car, right? Now, the flip side of that is your depth perception is not correct anymore, right? And that's why they remind you that the object is actually closer than it really appears. Um, if you were, I used to drive a delivery van when I was, uh, when I was 16. I got a job driving a, a delivery van. And there were no windows in the back of the van, so you had to learn to use your your side mirrors um, pretty well, otherwise you were in trouble. Um, so I remember uh, this, the van that I usually drove, the, the one uh, that, I, that I usually drove was this, I don't know if you guys ever heard of these, this, it was a Chevy Astro van. You guys ever, 
You guys know what I'm talking about? With no, with no windows in the back. The, the passenger side mirror, the only time I've ever seen this in a vehicle, the passenger side mirror was a plain flat mirror. It was, it was not convex. And it was a nightmare trying to pass somebody or to parallel park with that. Okay, which, imagine with no back windows and no convex mirror on the, on the right side, you can't shoulder check and you can't see much of a, a field of view because it's, because it's a plain flat mirror. If you were pulling past somebody, like, the only way you could see them is if they were directly in line with that mirror, okay, which made it a royal, royal pain. So you want to have that convex mirror there. Where else have you seen it? You might not realize this, but sometimes you might see a convex mirror that is convex on one plane, not like, not like this one where it's convex on each axis, x and y, but convex like this on one axis only and flat on the other axis. Right, see what I mean? Imagine, you're, imagine you go into an expensive store, sells this, all this expensive clothes, and uh, you're like, I, man, this is like 150 bucks for this. I better go in and try it on, make sure it fits first. And then you go into the change room, and you're like, boy, I look pretty good in these. Like, I look really thin in these. Do you ever think that maybe they're just trying to trick you just a little bit? That the mirror that they're using is slightly convex on the x-axis, which means vertically you don't change size, but horizontally you become smaller. So when you turn and face it and say, oh, I look a little bit thinner than I did in these other clothes that I tried on yesterday at this other store. It would have to be imperceptibly convex, right? Otherwise, otherwise it would be too noticeable, right, that they were trying to trick you. Okay, we're going to spend some time here drawing array diagrams for both of these types of mirrors, convex and concave. And, uh, and then we're going to do a little bit of math. The good news is the ray diagrams are not all that much different than the ray diagrams for lenses. And the mathematics are exactly the same as they were for lenses. What type of mirror is this? If we put our object that is over here on this side, what type of mirror is this? Not convex. It's concave. It's thinner in the middle than it is at the edges. It's concave, which means, well, if it was a lens, If it was a lens, concave would be diverging. As a mirror, concave means converging. We're going to define this as F, the focal point. We're going to define this as 2F. But in brackets, I'm going to call this 2F something else. In addition to being a spacer, twice the focal length, thank you, it will also be the center of curvature of this. So in other words, if I was to draw a complete circle, the center of the circle would be at twice the focal length. Remember that. Sometimes you may be given a question where you're given the radius of the lens. Uh, sorry, of the mirror, I should say. The radius of the mirror. The radius of the mirror would be the distance from the mirror to the center of the circle. The focal length would be half that. So if you're given the radius, you're effectively given the focal length. You just got to divide it by two. All right. There are three rays that we can draw. There's a million rays that we could draw here, but three that are very predictable. We're only going to draw two at a time for each particular mirror. First ray, always, no matter what mirror we're drawing, where the object is, first ray is going to go parallel to the principal axis. On a converging mirror, where do you think that ray is going to go? Position 1, position 2, position 3, or position 4? Position 2, down through the focal point. Good. First ray parallel to the principal axis, down through the focal point. Just like it was with lenses, just remember that lenses, the focal point was somewhere else. It was on the other side of the lens versus here it's on the same side. Second ray 
is going to go down from the top of the object down to the focal point. Where is it going to go from there? Man, physics is so symmetrical. Electricity causes magnetism. Magnetism causes electricity. All right. If, if A can cause B, then B can often cause A. Well, if the first ray goes parallel then through the focal point, then the second ray is going through the focal point, then parallel to the principal axis. Going to go right here. Where do these intersect? Right here. The image characteristics are it is smaller, it is inverted, and it is real or virtual? Real. Solid lines intersect, which means that we could project it onto a screen if we chose to do that. Do you guys remember for a converging lens what the three characteristics were the first time? Smaller, inverted, and real. Same as they are for a converging mirror in the first diagram. Not a coincidence. Let's draw that second diagram now. This time our object is going to be at 2F or the center, or the radius, whatever you want to call it. Hold off on drawing this one. You want to see what the image looks like before you draw, because this is one, just like in lenses, you may have to fudge a little bit. First ray, top of the object, down through the focal point. Second ray, down through the focal point. And then it's going to go parallel to the principal axis. They should converge right underneath the object, right underneath 2F. If they don't, Fix it. So they do. Characteristics of this one would be that it is same size. It is inverted. And it is real. Solid lines intersect. We could project this onto a screen. Remember with lenses, when we had converging lenses, the second diagram produced an image that was same size inverted, and real. Just the same as for converging mirrors. Again, not a coincidence. Remember the third diagram for lenses? We had, remember we had inverted, real, and smaller. Inverted, real, same size. Inverted, real, and larger. Okay, that's what we should get for this next mirror diagram as well. Let's just double check that though. First ray goes parallel to the principal axis down through the focal point. Second ray down through the focal point parallel. They converge over here. That image is larger. Uh, it is inverted and it is real. Some of you remember the patterns of attributes that we saw for lenses. Those patterns are going to be exactly the same for, lens, for mirrors as they are for lenses. In fact, you can get away without drawing any ray diagrams if you remember those patterns. And now that we're doing mirrors, you can see that there's more value in remembering those patterns because they're exactly the same. Remember, for lenses and for mirrors, they start off smaller inverted real then same size inverted real, then larger inverted and real. What was the next one for lenses? Yeah, that was the big transition, right? Something big was going to happen. There was no image. Okay, let's draw the next ray, ray diagram for mirrors here, where our object is at F. First ray, parallel, then down through the focal point. Second ray, pay attention to this one because it's different. Second ray, we can't draw through the focal point because we're at the focal point. Second ray, this time, really it's a third ray, drawing a different one. This time it's going to go up away from 2F. Let's pretend it reflects off of that mirror. And reflects right back.
right back where it came from. So parallel through the focal point, then straight up away from 2F, straight back where it came from through 2F. Where do they intersect? They don't intersect anywhere there, so let's extend them. They also don't intersect here, which tells us that what? We have no image, which we exa is exactly what we expected, because that's exactly what we had for a converging lens, where the object was placed at F. No surprise. So smaller, real, inverted, same size, real, inverted, larger, real, inverted, no image, what comes next? Remember, it's a big transition here, right? This is going to be a virtual image, and it is going to be upright, and it is going to be larger, larger, upright, and virtual. Let's just double check that. The next diagram has our object placed inside F. First ray is parallel and down through the focal point. The second ray we're going to draw is really that third ray that we just drew, the one that goes from the top of the object as if it's going away from 2F, and then it reflects back upon itself through 2F. Let's extend these reflected rays. And this is what we get. It is, as we predicted, larger. As we predicted, it is upright. And as we predicted, it is virtual. So those five converging mirror diagrams produce image characteristics that are exactly the same as those five converging lens diagrams. Just remember that the image for a mirror for a, uh, is, is flipped uh, on the opposite side, of the, op opposite side of the device than it was for a lens. So a virtual image is produced on the opposite side for a mirror, it was produced on the same side for a lens. Characteristics still the same, numbers still the same, but it's on the opposite side of the lens, or opposite side of the mirror, I should say. Let's draw the next one, which is, this is completely different, right? This is our diverging mirror. Let's put our object way out here. Two rays that we're going to draw. First one goes from the top of the object to the mirror. Where's it going to go? One, two, three, or four? One, two, three, four. One. Can't go this way. How come? The mirror gets in the way. Right? The light reflects off of the mirror. So it's not going to go this way. Wants to go this way. Instead of going this way, it goes opposite to that. It diverges away from that, line, from that uh, focal point. Second ray. The well, second ray wants to go from the top of the object down to the focal point right here. Right? It wants to go right through there, but it can't. How come? The mirror gets in the way. So it goes towards it, but then when it hits the mirror, it just reflects. Where is it going to reflect? Parallel. Now watch carefully. I am not going to extend this ray down. I don't extend the ray that hit the mirror. I extend the ray that reflected off of the mirror. This blue ray is an extension of the reflected ray. This, this green ray is an extension of the reflected ray. So make sure that green ray is drawn properly. It's parallel because it's an extension of the reflected ray. They intersect right here, which tells us we have an image that is smaller. It is upright, and it is virtual. Do you remember the image characteristics when we had a diverging lens? In all five cases, it was smaller, upright, and virtual. You're going to draw the next four here now at your desks, but you can probably predict right now what image characteristics you're going to get. For all four of them, you're going to get smaller, upright, and virtual, just like we did with lenses. OK, do that now, please. Finally. Let's take a, little bit of, we'll take a look at a little bit of math for converging and diverging mirrors. This page that we're going to fill in right now is exactly the same as the page that we filled in at the beginning of our lens section. 
except it says curved mirror math instead of curved lens math. The two equations that we use, exactly the same. Instead of calling it the lens equation, now we'll call it the mirror equation. 1 over f is equal to 1 over do plus 1 over di. And then, of course, we still have the magnification equation. m is equal to hi over ho, which is equal to negative di over do. Exactly the same equations. Now, let's go through the sign conventions. They're the same as well. Remember the first three variables, f, do, and di? Positive, negative is based on what? Real or virtual. So we're going to say f is positive if it's a real focal point, and it's negative if it's a virtual focal point. Now, when do we have a real focal point? If it's a converging mirror. Or if it's a converging lens, for that matter. It's negative if it's a virtual focal point. We have a virtual focal point if it's a diverging mirror or diverging lens. Just remember that we have a difference between diverging and converging lenses versus mirrors. A converging mirror is concave. A converging lens is convex. DO is positive if it's real, if it's a real object. The good news for us is we always have a real object. We always have a positive DO. It's negative if you have a virtual object, but that's not going to happen for us in Physics 30. Might next year in first year physics at university, but it's not going to happen this year. Bless you. DI is positive if it's a real image. And it's negative if it's a virtual image. When do you have a real image? Well, there's three. Out of the ten diagrams we do for mirrors, there's three of them that produce a real image. Firstly, it has to be a converging mirror. Secondly, the object has to be far out, right? Beyond the focal point. Remember the first one we had? Smaller, inverted, real. Then we had same size, inverted, real. And then we had larger, inverted, real. Those first three diagrams produced a real image. The next one was no image. And then the next six were virtual images, so negative DIs. What about HO and HI? Positive, negative based on what? Not real virtual, but rather, you guys know this? Upright or inverted, good. HO is positive if it's an upright object, which is almost always going to be the case. It's negative if it's an inverted object. HI is positive if you have an upright image. And it's negative if you have an inverted image. You might remember this. You don't have to, but it's, sometimes it might be helpful. Just another pattern. A virtual image is always upright. And a real image is always inverted. So if you think back to those ray diagrams or those patterns, they tell you it's a real image. You can remember that a real image is always upside down. And therefore, it would be a negative HI. We're left with one more variable here. That's M. You guys remember when M is positive? Yeah, that's right. M is positive when object and image are on the same side of the principal axis. In other words, if they're both upright or both inverted, M is positive. If one is upright and one is inverted, M is negative. Example number one, a candle placed 49 centimeters in front of a convex mirror. I'm going to underline that, circle that, whatever convex mirror is. Convex mirror is diverging, which means that my focal point is negative. Draw attention to that for sure. The radius of curvature is 70 centimeters. What is that telling me? The focal length is 35. But we already established that that's going to be negative, right? 
So jot that down. What's the image distance, the magnification, and the attributes? So let's write down our givens here. Uh, we have an object distance of 49 centimeters. We have a focal length of negative 35 centimeters. We want to find di. We want to find m and then the attributes. Let's find di first using my mirror equation. We used to call it the lens equation. Now we're calling it the mirror equation. 1 over f is equal to 1 over do plus 1 over di. 1 over negative 35 equals 1 over 49 plus 1 over di. Everybody do this with me here. We've got negative 35, 1 over negative 35. What are we going to do this 49? Subtract it. Subtract 1 over 49. And then flip that over. We get a value for di of negative 20.4166, which we're going to round to, to two digits. There's two, there's the third digit. The third digit is five or less. So it becomes negative 20. We round down. And then M. M is negative DI over DO. DI is what? Negative 20.41667 over 49. Is that right? Yes, it is. Good. Thank you. It's double negative because it's negative di, and di is already negative, so it is a double negative. Um, that gives us 0 0.42. What do we know? Look at di. Di is negative. That tells me that the image is what? F, do, di, based on real or virtual. Di is negative. The image is virtual. The magnification is positive, which tells me it's upright. And it's less than 1, which tells me the image is smaller. If it was greater than 1, it would tell me the image is bigger. Now, some of you may not have done that at all. Some of you may have looked at this and said, oh, wait, it's a diverging mirror. Anytime you have a diverging lens or diverging mirror, the attributes are? Smaller, upright, and virtual, if you remember the patterns, right? You never have to, but it's sometimes helpful to remember those patterns. Okay, your homework for tonight. It's going to sound a little bit weird because you had worksheet number 18 that we checked over earlier. Your homework is going to be worksheet number 16. Worksheet number 16, it's on converging mirrors. But there are eight questions on that page. I only want you to do the first four. In addition to, of course, what I mentioned earlier, which was practice question set number 23. So I think you got a total, a grand total of six questions due to tonight, two here and four here.